Welcome back, everyone, and good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. So we will begin today's uh, portion of the conference with uh, Professor Kumkum Bhavnani, who is a distinguished professor of sociology at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And her research interests lie within development, feminist, and cultural studies. She has published a number of books and articles, including Talking Politics, Shifting Identities, Shifting Racisms, Feminism and Race, and Feminist Futures. She has also completed a number of documentaries, including The Shape of Water, Nothing Like Chocolate, Luta, You Think You Can't Dance, and she is currently working on her next documentary, Science for Nuns slash Monks. Uh, today, she will be speaking to us about conversations with feminisms in the 21st century. So please join me in welcoming Kumkum Bhavnani. Well, I want to start by uh, thanking you all for having me here. I want to thank Ranjana and Sara for all they've done to organize it. Of course, I want to thank Janetta for uh, her sterling work. And it's just lovely to see people who I haven't seen in ages and to meet some lovely new people as well. So thank you for having me. Um, I started at Smith in July 2000, and it was after volume one, number one, of Meridians had been uh, put together and edited, but not produced. So I was the inaugural editor because the ed editorial collective did that first uh, um, issue. And then they decided they, did, they w needed someone to be an editor for the journal. Ruth Simmons was at Smith when I was there. And as so many have said, she was always a champion of the journal. And I feel so privileged that I worked with her for a year before she left for Brown. Her clear-eyed understanding of issues that impacted the content and production of the journal, accompanied by her inevitably astute insights when I consulted her on matters that demanded delicacy, ensured that my time as the inaugural editor did the journal proud, or at least I hope it did. My arrival at Mer as editor at Meridian's launch day. Meridian's was launched in 2000, its first issue due to come into our hands in November 2000. A few months earlier, at the turn of the century, many had been worried about the Y2K, that year 2000, the notion that because all four years of the digit, all four digits of the year changed, all computers all around the globe would break down. Somehow that never happened. Just so you know, I spent the turn of the century sleeping in a brand new dress at home. I really wanted to celebrate it, but with a three and a half and two year old and waking up as I had requested to watch the clock for 30 seconds as it ushered in the next century. And then I returned to my bed. But it was a new century and it was perfect timing at which to launch a journal. At the launch of the first issue of Meridians on November 2000, in which I had an article about grasping the complexities of hybrid identities through film, Smith College had a grand launch for the journal. I'm going to get my other glasses. <coughs> the preceding days were fraught a week before the launch, on the very day when we were expecting copies of the first issue to arrive at Smith, Tom Radko of Wesleyan University Press said the journal would not be ready, although all preparations for the reception, etc., were. It was a big deal. I wasn't at all sure what to do. The inaugural editor and the first issue edited, as Janetta has explained by the collective, would not be ready. Ruth Simmons, wise as ever, simply said to me, Hold his feet to the fire. This is not allowed to happen. I repeated that. The journal copies arrived on the afternoon of the day of the reception. Thank you, Ruth. At the launch, I introduced the journal and my vision. I opened my words like this. 
Last night, I went to see Billy Elliot. Remember, we're in 2000. Last night, I went to see Billy Elliot, a film set in the mid-1980s about an 11-year-old white working-class boy living with his father and brother, both of whom are striking minors and have been engaged in a long struggle against pit closures. Billy also lives with his grandmother, who is living with Alzheimer's. The film, set in a Durham pit village, takes the viewer into Billy's world, a world in which he simply cannot stop dancing, having started to watch a ballet class. Despite the masculinist repercussions from his father and brother, as well as accusations of becoming middle class. At one point in the film, Billy is asked what he feels when he is dancing. He pauses, mumbles, don't know, thinks and then says, it's like electricity. Billy's image of doing something you love and are passionate about as electricity may not be one with which I identify, worrying as many do about the future of planet Earth. Yet hearing him say that made me realize that my job as editor of Meridians is similar to what electricity connotes for Billy. Sheer delight, joy, and passion. That was how I felt delight and passion. The launch of Meridians at the turn of the century offered a time of possibility, and with only four editors in the past decade, two decades, it's possible to see what a precious space the journal is for so many of us. We never want to leave. Miriam Chauncey was the editor following me. Her first issue was volume three, number two, published in 2003. She explained her view for the journal as a ground which does not shift, a safe ground for exchanges that may be confrontational at times, comforting at others, but always challenging and progressive, opening up doors into fields of knowledge that can inform each of us about how various societies are actively shaping the tenor of women of color's lives in these unstable times. What our grandmothers knew, of course, says Miriam, is that there have never been stable times for women of color. Two years later, Paula Giddens, who had come to Smith in 2001, 2002, I was going to check with her, but she's had to take a flight back, took over the reins of the journal in 2004, 5, with volume five, number two, being her first issue. After quoting Bessie Head, Paula writes, above ground, Rain clouds have indeed gathered, and they are accompanied by a rising gale of reactionary forces. The certainties of fundamentalism, the exclusions of globalization, and the militarism of mindless markets push against us. The landscape, however, is too heavily seeded by courageous activism, groundbreaking scholarship, and protest fashioned into art to yield. Historically, the thunderclap born of such tensions portends transformative moments, periods of unprecedented creativity and insight. Revealed are numerous sites of the underground spring with its own inexorable will to rise. As the new editor of Meridians, says Paula, I feel the responsibility and excitement of sustaining the journal's mission to be one of these underground sites. How prescient she is. And now, as readers of Meridians, we're fortunate to engage with Ginetta Candelario's vision, volume 17, number one, who closes her first editor's introduction with, as we were heading to press, the Brazilian Mariel Franco and her driver, Anderson Gomez, were murdered on March 14th, 2018, in Rio de Janeiro, where Franco, a self-described black, bisexual, feminist favelada was a recently elected city council member. Her death stunned and inspired outrage throughout the world. As Flavia Santos de Arajo eulogizes in the Mariel Presente talk that she offered at the Franco Memorial event held at Smith College on March 21st, 2018, a week after the murder, thank you, Jeanetta, for getting that going, said, Marielle was a threat to so many violent, corrupt, and powerful factions because she was an outspoken human rights advocate of and organizer of 
Rio's poorest and most vulnerable. Thus, says Ginetta, this issue closes with an in memoriam for Marielle Franco and is dedicated to all black women resistors across time and place from the early 20th century to today, whose fields of activism range from the college campus to the world of literature, from the tips of the hair on their heads to the valleys of their interior worlds, from Texas to Puerto Rico, Rio and Ghana. We join Arajo in honoring you as a whole in your many selves and in being with you for the struggle yet to come. That's the, uh, the line of editors who, ha who have worked and are working on Meridians. The first issue had been uh, curated, had been put together, had been edited. It just had to go to press. Just uh, The amount I learned about production, you know, in a month or so is incredible. I had some great teachers. But just the week before I arrived at Smith, on, July 20, on June 25th, Barbara Christian had died. I knew Anne Ducille at Wesleyan, and I knew that she had spent time with Barbara's work and with Barbara. I realized that to be a good editor, one had to be opportunistic, and I immediately contacted Anne to see if she might offer a piece on Barbara Christian. She did. And then... I had to have many discussions with Tom Radko at Wesleyan University Press, whom I had not met, really, um, to include the tribute, even though the whole issue was in proofs and page numbers were locked in. He finally did include the piece, as we worked out how we could use Latin numerals to paginate this extra piece at the front of the journal. Handy hint. This is how Anne closed her tribute. My own hair has grayed, my eyesight has failed, my former students are publishing books of their own and coming up for tenure. I think of Barbara Christian's fear that she would have no intellectual progeny. I think of our last conversation, of the praise song she sang on her students' behalf, and of her admonition to me to take care of myself. I think about her brilliance and her generosity. And I hope, I pray, that at the time she crossed over, she knew that she had indeed given birth to generations of feminist daughters and sons who carry the torches she lit into the next century. The first issue that I fully curated in 2001, led with an article by Paula Giddings, that's whatever number it is anyway, you know, volume one, number two or something, led with an article by Paula Giddings on Ida B. Wells called Missing in Action, and pieces on Edwidge Danticat by a Smith College and Meridian's intern, on the global sex trade, on violence against women of color in the US, and a review essay on food. There were also pieces on the women scientists in the Nobel laureate C.V. Raman's lab, white women and critical race theory, and racism in Australia. Later issues carried pieces by, for example, Angela Davis on race, gender, and the prison industrial complex, Aliens and the Language of Invasion in Biology, an article on translating Meridians, the Meridians Peace Roundtable at Harvard, and a piece on Mestijaje as transnational feminisms in Ana Castillo's So Far From God. And later issues included more, Black Women's Writing, Black Women's Art and Activism, a feminist archive on September 11th, compiled by Paula uh, and Amrita Basu, an interview with Ruth Simmons, and so much else besides. But there was always a poem in between the longer essays to ensure that poetry is never forgotten in our work. For example, Adrian Sue's poem, Epigram. No man is an island, I learned in first year Latin. About women, they said nothing, until we got to feminism. Work. Not a husband or children is a woman's reason for being. And I gave myself to poetry as women who preceded me had given themselves to men. Back to my first issue in the editor's introduction. I wrote, 
I see a role for meridians as engaging with feminism, race, and transnationalism. These terms are fraught with tension, contestation, and contradiction amongst themselves as well as in relation to each other. And these are the conversations with feminisms in the 21st century that I hope we can talk about today. Let me start with tensions. Sexual violence, sexual harassment are issues that pervade our lives. They permeate our lives and always have done. In the recent period, we have become much more aware of them and more sensitive to their impact on people, mostly women, throughout our, their lives. Here, I want to mention the right for the presumption of innocence, innocent until proven guilty, which are rights that I hold dear. How do I account for that when I look at many university policies on SVSH, sexual violence, sexual harassment? Everything is done to protect the complainant. Rightly so, I know, but at what cost? I hear someone allege that Brett Kavanaugh raped her, and I have no desire for him to become a Supreme Court justice. And yet... It seems to me that a moral panic has developed in the way described by Stuart Hall around SVSH, in which public discourses, the story, assume guilt on the part of the respondent. I won't go into what moral panic is, we can talk about it later. I know the reasons for our collective anxiety and the research why we do that. And again, I say, and yet. Let me complicate it further. I love complexity and messiness, by the way. When an allegation is brought against a physician, for example, an OBGYN of SVSH, how do I, with my desire for presumption of innocence, balance that right with the rights of patients to feel safe when seeing a doctor? And throw differential racisms into the mix, and I just don't know where to start. How can we talk about these things? tensions? How can we have this conversation while staying true to the many competing principles most of us, all of us, hold dear? The second thing I want, I'd like to talk about, and again, just sort of be, you know, uh, see where a conversation could go. I now move to contestation. I argue often rather fiercely, and have done in my films, that women are not victims. Yet, for example, research conducted into natural disasters such as bushfires and droughts in Australia found that they have increased the risk of domestic violence in rural reg regions. One of the reasons for this, says the UN, is a social and psychological pressure arising from loss of income resulting from the growing impact of climate change on the agricultural setter, sector. A report by CARE found that in most disasters, women and children are worst affected. 80% of displaced people are women and children. The report highlights that one out of five women who are refugees or have been displaced because of a natural disaster has experienced sexual violence. But what do we do, the we without the other, do in the meantime? How can I write and even think about it? Women suffer. And while we are also re uh, resilient, how do we avoid the language of victimology without masking that it is women who suffer? I don't want to mask the presence of women. And which women suffer? And how do we think about third world women here? I don't know. So that was tension, contestation, and contradiction, the best of the group. Nationalism is the cry of the scoundrel, writes someone. Forgive me, as I cannot remember who. We draw on nationalism to urge ourselves and others to be moved to activism. Black nationalism is often used in articles to analyze what is happening around us. Organizing against colonialism is often rallied by a nationalist cry. And then we see what happens. Algeria's betrayal by the nationalists, fascism in India, 
Stalinism in the Soviet Union, post Lumumba in the Belgian Congo, and the USA. Too many examples to talk about. So that's one contradiction. How do we talk about nationalism to inspire us or inspire many of us and at the same time stop it, not use it? At the same time as we talk about contradictions, I also worry about uh, contradictions when we talk about difference amongst women, let's say. I am clear, as I should be, that differences amongst women must be acknowledged in our politics, to say, nothing, to say of nothing in our analyses. And yet I also talk about women as a group. Someone said that when they say women, they cross their fingers behind their back, and then when they specify, they uncross their fingers and put their hands forward. We talk about women as a group, and I certainly say women are not bonded simply through a common biology. I am not an essentialist, and yet. Gayatri Spivak's idea of strategic essentialism does not work for me, and I'd love to have a conversation about that. I don't know how I am active in politics if I know that simultaneously I'm speaking a non-truth. Tension, contestation, contradiction. These are the conversations I want to have with feminisms in the 21st century. Let me conclude. From Meridian's volume two, number two, editor's introduction, my words. We demonstrate the intricacy of inequalities and thus the many faceted manner of their eradication. It is not merely the interconnections amongst feminisms, race and transnationalism that the journal Meridian seeks to map. I prefer interconnections to intersections because interconnections captures the permeability of inequalities as well as the shifting relationship of shifting nature of the relationships among them. It's not just feminism, race, and transnationalism that Meridian seeks to map, but also that women of color, third world women, can and do create ideas and practices in which the global and the local cannot, and perhaps must not, be disentangled from each other. It is this set of entanglements and the ways in which they can unravel that remain for me the hallmark of meridians. Thank you. Um, Please argue the, with me as well. <laughs> well, I have a question, and it's it's uh, I I was thinking about Alexis's characterization as the question is a as a coded statement. Um, this is a question, um, a real one. Yeah. What happens? So we have these three terms, transnationalism, race, feminism. What happens in the transnational context when our locations for multiplicity are embedded either uh, sort of by default or by lack of mention in the US? So for a journal like Meridian's, how do we take the concept of multiplicity do we take it through a, a category or an analytic frame like intersectionality? Does it complicate that frame? What kind of work does the transnational um, kind of visibility of the work by women of the global south, by women of color around the world as well as in the US, how, how do we ask that, those sets of questions in an, in an international flame when intersectionality has become a kind of, uh, almost like a papering over of contradictions rather than, than an asking of these difficult questions? Well, I have no idea. Absolutely none. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we all look to Janetta to solve all that for us in the forthcoming <laughs> issues, and including the ones she's already produced. They're so great. Um, so I, I honestly, I mean, I genuinely don't know. It was a quip, but I don't know. But I think you're right. I think that's very astute, and I should, you know, I, it's helped me. I should have thought of it meaning it's helped me to say that intersectionality could lead to a papering over of contradictions. You know, that 
it's just like the list. You know, we talk about, we talk, and, and we all do it. I do it. Mm -hmm. And yet I know there's something weak about it. So I don't know how we do it, but I, I think that when we can have pieces that talk to each other, I, I don't know, I'm making this up a bit as I go along. Um, you know, a woman who's living in the third world talking about something specific, let's say the things in Delhi that have happened in the past few days, yes. you know? Yes. Um, and then someone living in the first world, I don't know, in France, let, not take it away from the US, writing about Les Miserables, the film that's come out, you know? And then someone in the US writing about, I don't know, a play or a novel or something, right? So that we get them in conversation with each other from different locations, but also the wonderful thing about Meridians is, and you know, thanks to the collective that set it up, is that it always has fiction, poetry, art embedded in it. The covers that I had were pretty boring. <laughs> A friend of mine in England, when I sent it to her so proudly, she said, oh, you've got a sort of burgundy cover, you know? Uh, yeah, and then it was blue, and then it was red, <laughs> and then Miriam just let it explode, and uh, Paula took it even further. So uh, anyway, that's just saying that, that, you know, there's something there that Meridians has something that allows us to talk about those things. So I have a similarly perhaps unanswerable question, but I guess I, um, I guess I just wanted to hear more of your thoughts about strategic essentialisms and your rejection of that. And maybe do you have like do you have an alternative or how how do you conceptualize um, like solidarities differently? Yeah, I you know, I just don't know. And again, I rely on strategic essentialism. You know, this is all old stuff, but it's sort of within our heads all the time. Chela Sandoval talks about uh, some version of it. Um, you see, my, my hesitation is, although Gayatri Spivak uses it and says it's a tactic, there are tactics and tactics. Very profound, huh? Uh, so... It feels like it's a, like I can have a tactic that I say, well, in order to ensure physician sa uh, patient safety, a physician where there's, you know, an allegation should be removed without any publicity until it's proved, right? I mean, there's ways to do it. I've, I've just learned a lot about medical boards in California. So I've been convinced that it's possible to do it. Of course, the person feels bad and so on, you know, until it's proved and, the, and then... It, it, it often is. I'm not, anyway, I won't go there, but at least there's some protection there for a right that we all hold dear. And so I feel okay with that tactic. But a tactic when I use nationalism, I use it, you know, I feel a bit sick inside. You know, it's not even like saying women when I know there are differences and so on, because that's not dishonest. It's saying I don't know how to deal with it. But strategic essentialism just seems to me to use the easiest way out. And it's helpful. I mean, you know, please don't tell Gayatri I've said all this. Uh, it's helpful, but it just doesn't work for me. I find myself stopping myself when I use that idea you know, the thing of as a mother, as a something, as a something else, you know. Um, I don't, I actually don't do that anymore. I don't like it. I don't know. What do other, can I, can I, let's hear from others because it's meant to be a conversation. So what do others think? I mean, please support the idea of strategic essentialism. I need to, I've been grappling with this for 20 years. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a, a, a question about that as well and right. maybe a suggestion so maybe this can be a sort of a conversation because I think I think Gayathri herself has taken yes. back her faith in that term strategic essentialism mm -hmm. she says sometimes one needs to be strategic yeah. right but actually what she was even what she was arguing in that essay mm -hmm. isn't really about essentialism no right mm -hmm. so um so I think that she's taken that back and it, it seems to me that one of the things that she was getting at in that um, in that essay, and didn't even didn't fully use those terms, 
is that she's talking about the importance of being able to articulate um, a shared, um, some shared material conditions that affect those who live under the mark of woman, right? And yep. so under, un, well, and under the signifier of woman, actually. Right. So, um, so I mean, I, I think, I think that that we can't then sort of say. Um, I mean, if, if we believe that, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. think that that's actually a very good point, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, then um, then we we are able to say use the term women because women is actually women are um, uh, um, a, a category that share some material conditions. Certainly not all, right? I mean, I think that that's that that that, that that's certainly true. So I mean, I would. I would say that that actually that term essentialism went crazy at a certain point, <laughs> and it was only supposed to be about the biological when it was developed. That we don't want to attribute um, characteristics to um, to that to that to to those we identify biologically as women, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's the way where it should stay. I mean, that's where essentialism should should lie and you know even if we now think about the biological differently than we did when that idea was developed i think that we have to be able to say women sometimes otherwise you know other you know i mean it's true that there have been many sins in the project of feminism right absolutely i mean it is a you know it has been a flawed movement in most contexts that we have to we have to repair um, or we have to um, we we have to acknowledge and see how the contradictions play out. At the same time, I feel that we need to be able to say women sometimes um, as a as a as a material category. And yes, of course, acknowledge the differences. But I think that we also can't get caught up in the anthropological distinctions. I mean, I think that these are also issues. No. Absolutely, absolutely, no. and I, I'm interrupting you because no. I'm, I'm just going to say something and then you come back, no. you know, come right back at me, please, no. or both of you, all of you, because um, <laughs> you're absolutely right that, you know, we do have to, ah, yes, but what I want to talk, so, ah, yes, I talk about using it, I don't, I don't think I can stop using the word women, but I want us to keep having the discussion rather than feeling it's resolved. Yeah. You know, Gayatri Spivak, she did pull back. Yes. I'm not, you know, it's still used, you know, whatever. It has a life of its own. And so let's take advantage of contradictions because it's through contradictions that we move forward. So let's just argue about it. Let's keep talking about it. It doesn't mean that when I'm doing a talk, that I don't just say women, that I say, oh, women, and I qualify everything. But let's ha continue to have those conversations. That's what it is. It's like, I hadn't thought of this until this minute, it's like the intersectionality might be papering over contradictions. If we don't actually talk about it in this arena, I don't mean only in class, I, do only as, but I don't mean in classes alone. Just amongst ourselves, we're going to, again, paper it over and mask it. Now, I, that's all. I think right. not. That's all. But I, I'm working it out as I go along. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying at this moment. Anyway, that it's through contradictions. Let's talk and fight about it yes. within ourselves. You know, yes, so that we can. No, I mean, I. I don't see it as a I sin. I share in the other allergy. Words. I share the allergy to as a mother, as a sister, yeah, yeah, as yeah. a woman, as a human. I don't I like. like yeah, I don't human. like those. I don't. I. <laughs> resist them as well, <laughs> resist all that as well. So I'm totally with you there. And then just, you know, some, something about the, the doctor situation. Yeah. Well, it's because, I, mean, I, I don't know if you've read about this Dr. Yeah. Julian Heaps at yes. UCLA. It's just as good. Yes, anyway. and you know, I actually have a friend, a friend who, who was, who was lo looked after by him when she was pregnant and then, um, or at least the one in Pennsylvania it might oh, be a okay. different, a okay, different, yeah. there's one yeah. in New York as well. And anyway, yeah, she, yeah. she felt Sorry. uncomfortable when he asked her to strip so he could see whether she, her spine was suitable for an epidural when there was no one else in the room. So, I mean, I think that, you know, 
there are some there are some things that are um that are in place legally right like you're supposed to have someone else in the room not that that necessarily is going to solve it, all the problems. It wasn't required right? in right. the UC until just now. Oh, really? Just oh, okay. Now, I mean, you know, okay. last okay. week or last okay. month or something, okay. the policy yeah. is developed to yeah. have a chaperone in the yeah. room. So, but I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm totally with you. I mean, I think, you know, I, even if one believes an accusation and understands that, um, understands that that uh, that. The, the the legal system is actually pitted against women who yeah. make accusations. We end up in a impossible situation. And if one if one believes at all in some kind of attempt to um, to constitute a legal system that um, can deal with these things, um, then one has to say. There has to be a presumption. We have of to be. We have to be right? creative. Well, I know I mean, someone yeah. behind you wants yeah. to say something. Yeah. I mean, I think we do. But the Brett Kavanaugh thing yeah. got to me because yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I want to go back a little bit to the nationalism part. You yeah, said, please, do. Transnationalism, mm -hmm. because I think they're contradictions. But um, I find myself increasingly never ever talking that I'm from India. Because I just say I grew up in India, you know, like it's changed over as I've been here and then been to other countries and done things and met people and connected with people at the transnational level. I find that that transnationalism helps me transcend national identities, even as and then I'm OK now living with contradictions, you know, um, because I, I can't say I belong to any place. So it's that sort of thing that, yes, yeah. and I'm, I mean, I, I don't know who else wants to join personally, in. Personally, <laughs> I'm fine with it, you know, yeah. and I don't feel insecure with it. Transnationalism is really, for me, the way out of the contradiction. That's interesting. Yes. Uh, there's people in the back. I don't know if there's anyone who wants to say anything. Just... Uh, yeah, go on. Yeah, I think I we should add sit in a circle. Like, uh, maybe like in in different contexts, we use like different parts of our like different cards of our identities. And I feel like you know, um, I mean, when I when I teach in Turkey, I feel more like a woman. But when I teach here, I'm more like a Middle Eastern. Um, although you know, I mean, none of these work. Uh, but sometimes it's useful. I mean, you know, I mean, but it's always continuously changing, right? Yeah. So in, in your words, maybe like I'm a woman yet, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> adding more to it and complicating it. Maybe that's, you know, always what we do. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I don't know. I mean, this morning I was listening to NPR reporting on the tens of thousands of refugees from Syria who Turkey has said, okay, we're not abiding by this agreement anymore. Go ahead and have a run at the Greek border who are being shot, who are being put into buses by men in black suits and taking who knows where, right? And so, you know, the stakes are really high. So I, I always worry, and this is the conversation around essentialism and the theory, I, sometimes I worry that we're going to theorize ourselves out of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And I'm remembering that I was in a graduate seminar, this is now 25 years ago, um, actually 24, because I was pregnant with my daughter. And that's a real material condition. I had a fetus in my body that was rubbing its elbows and heels into my ribs as I'm reading Judith Butler about how my body was a discursive construction. And I'm thinking, I don't think so, because no one told the fetus that, <laughs> right? And so, you know, trying to balance some very fine, sophisticated, theoretical, and politically necessary analysis with the fact that we do have bodies and that they do matter not just theoretically, but materially and, and politically and physically, right? So I think that's always where we get hung up a little bit. Right, you're absolutely right, Janetta. And, you know, that's why I said, you know, 80% of internally displaced people, 75% of refugees are women, I just say women and children, even though, forgive me for that, right, are women and children. Absolutely, I don't want to mask it. The, the minor I have at UCSB, 
I call it women, I call, you know, we, it was a group of us, we called it women culture development. We all agreed that we didn't want to call it gender. We did not want to mask the woman as it were. Absolutely. And then something else is going on in my head. Politically, and when, you know, I'm on a demonstration or, or you know, absolutely. But I still think we should talk about it. Yes, we don't want to theorize ourselves out of our bodies, as you've put it so well. But uh, I still want to talk about it. I want to talk, for example, about the moral panic that's developed around SVSH. Maybe that's what it is that I want to talk about. Because... You know, the moral panic is the one where there's a story told about what's going on. And Stuart Hall's, his, the example he gave was three young black men, you know, say they were 18 or something. They, this was around mugging, uh, policing the crisis, you know, that they attacked an old white woman, you know, took her handbag and took money and hit her. I mean, you know, hit her and left. The judge gave them 18 years for this, you know, and... There was no outcry. And so Stuart Hall sort of analyzes moral panic and how it spirals up. I mean, with Phil Cohen and all those other people from Birmingham. Um, and I really think that there's a moral pan panic around SVSH, and I don't know what to do about it. You know, So I think maybe that's where I'm going. I'm not trying to theorize ourselves out of our bodies because I'm always known for saying, oh, stuff it, you know, we've got to talk about politics. And yet... <laughs> <Someone> <laughs> I mean, I'm that. not helping by Go offering on, yeah. any, but I, I have the same concern, and it comes out of being a historian mm. of the Jim Crow South, mm. where that moral panic is not new, it is quite old. It serves particular political purposes yes. at particular moments, right? Mm. And we are lucky to be in a moment where it currently serves women's rights or some sort of discourse of like women and power in ways that are more, I don't know, that are less pernicious than it has in the past, but that can still be pernicious, but right? what if when a white woman makes an allegation against a black man? No, that's what I'm saying. Oh, that sorry, it's, sorry, it's so, keep it's keep so going, deeply sorry. rooted in the politics of white supremacy, yeah. certainly in the United States, but yeah. I would say elsewhere, that it is the phrase believe women actually makes me cringe in a way that this is the first time I've ever said that out loud, and if you tell my students, they'll come at me. But... You know, it's all right. We're all, you know, that's right, why I'm right, saying but the that's unsayable. The, but, yeah. you know, you think like, what would Ida B. Wells say in a moment like this? Oh. You know, so, again, no answers. What Just would she say? Chorus. Yeah, this is really, I mean, thank you. Everyone. <laughs> I'm so lazy. I'll just walk over and give you. <laughs> um, this is really thank you. This is really a productive discussion. I'm, along these lines, I'm helping to. I'm yeah, the chair right. of the Feminist okay. Masculinities Interest Group of the NWSA, and we're putting together a co-sponsored panel with um, women centers um, that that feminist that interest group in the NWSA about women centers and um, engagement with men. And one of the co conversations that we wanted to have with this roundtable was about, um, along the lines of moral panics, women's centers, um, uh, participation in carceral logics. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the balancing critical race theory with um, feminist theory. So to, to the extent that, that campuses respond to dangerous black men on campus, um, with alerts, and then women's centers might participate in criminalizing black men on campus at, in the sense, in the fear of um, men jumping out of bushes to attack you. Like, I mean, I think feminism has been engaged in a long time in trying to disinvest from re responding to sexual harm through the um, use of the state and through using um, imprisonment. But I think this is exactly the conversation we need to have in different spaces about, um, so believe women um, can't be left on its own. You have to put it in the context of the history of um, racism and settler, settler colonialism. You can't leave those things. You have to trouble those notions in the same kind of way. We have to trouble responses to sexual harm and beyond thinking about um, police. More policing um, is bad news from my vantage point. And so how do we respond to sexual harm um, beyond policing? Um, so those kinds of things, and they're really concrete issues, the kind of thing that hopefully we'll talk about this, this panel. Women's centers have traditionally been the place where people have suffered sexual harm come to go. And if I'm trying to disinvest from responding to harm with the state and policing, what, what other conversations do we need to have? 
And, you know, again, yes. So when a woman of color makes an allegation against a white man around sexual violence, sexual harassment, I'm more inclined to believe her. Now, but what, you know, so that's, it's exactly that. As, yes, as you said, it stays in this room for the moment because I just, of course we had these discussions two decades ago, you know, but it's time, isn't it, to reactivate them? Thank you very much. Thank you for engaging with me as well.